Welcome to Block by Block, where we dive into timely topics at the intersection of crypto, tech, and society. I'm your host, Danelle Dixon, CEO and Executive Director of the Stellar Development Foundation. My guest today is Avichal Garg, Managing Partner at Electric Capital, a VC focused on Web3. He's also a lifelong entrepreneur and has led teams that built products most of us have used at some point in our digital lives. All this means he's looking at investing in the future of Web3 with a future-proof, human-centered perspective. We talk about how Web3 is helping us tap remarkable human potential, the legal innovation that is a DAO, and so much more. Avichal, it is so great to have you here. Thanks for joining me today. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. We are on Block by Block. Um, We recently met at an event together, and I was struck by some of your comments on the usefulness of DAOs to artists, Mm. as well as your approach to investing in Web3 at Electric Capital. So we're going to dig into all of that and more today. Um, but first, for our listeners, could you just share a bit about yourself? Sure. Well, thank you for having me here. And yeah, that was a fun event. So we continue the conversation. So my name is Avichal. I'm one of the co-founders at Electric Capital. Uh, we are a seed and Series A focused uh, venture fund. We do uh, exclusively crypto and Web3. We were started in 2018, uh, sort of just about four years old at this point, uh, and have been very fortunate to uh, have some good early success. And so we've been able to scale things up. So um Earlier this year, we announced uh, our our newest fundraise, which was a billion dollars across two funds. Uh, We do equity, we do tokens, uh, you know, kind of full spectrum. A lot of what we do is uh, kind of on-chain and and the sorts of things that traditional VCs would have a tougher time with. Um, Kind of the the premise that we had when when we were starting Electric a a few years ago was that crypto VC would have to look really different from traditional VC. And what I mean by that is just, you know, we, we tend to think, uh, if you sort of believe crypto is software eating money, you know, software, all of a sudden ones and zeros are now a way to transfer value and are themselves valuable, um, which you kind of see with Bitcoin or Ethereum or NFTs, you know, people are taking fiat dollars and buying ones and zeros. Um, then really one of the killer applications of this stuff is going to be uh, the digitization of capital markets. And so if ones and zeros you know, are now money, then the movement of ones and zeros is sort of eats capital markets. and um, if that happens on these 24 uh, seven know, global markets on chain, then it's just a matter of time in our opinion that that will also eat venture capital. There's, there's just nothing you know, unique to venture capital in our opinion that prevents it from getting eaten up by software. And so we've tried to build our firm in such a way that it's future-proof in that way. And so uh, everybody on the investment team has computer science backgrounds, about half the team is uh, engineers and designers. So kind of, if you looked at our org chart, it doesn't, it doesn't look like a typical VC firm. It actually looks more like a startup. Uh, with a bunch of engineers and designers and product people, um, and then uh, the, you know the ops and legal and finance teams are actually quite small. It's like you know fifteen percent of the firm instead of eighty percent of the firm. I didn't intend to jump into that right away, but I'm sure. super interested in this whole like future proofing. So yeah. that is obviously a different structure in terms of how the VC itself is set up. But then, what is the other piece to get you to like the future proof part? Yeah, well, so kind of one of the. One of the hypotheses that Curtis and I had, Curtis is my co-founder of Electric, is uh, you know if you look at uh, if you look at any industry that gets eaten up by software, um, it's you can't just have the incumbents move over and participate very easily in in like the software enabled, software first world. So what's a, what's a good example of this? Take somebody like Amazon versus Walmart, and what I think is really fascinating is you know Amazon was started in 1994, so it's almost 30 years old as a company, mm-hmm. and 30 years into it, Walmart is just starting to figure out how to compete, uh, which is kind of wild, right? If you think about it, you're like, I don't understand. Yeah, why can't, why can't Walmart as of even 10 years into it, like, you know, five years after Amazon's IPO in something like 2005, why can't Walmart figure out how to compete? And it's because the hard part is not realizing what you need to do. It's, it's not just that you realize, oh, I need to go online first and I need to start having warehouses and process things with shopping carts and credit cards. That part is easy. The hard part is how do you change your human organization to take advantage of this new infrastructure and all these new things you can do. And so what you have to do, like if you look at Amazon versus Walmart, we have to do at Walmart is essentially swap out the CEO and, and take essentially the CTO or in, in a lot of these legacy businesses that would call them a CIO. And that person now needs to be the CEO. And all of the engineers in the organization, all of a sudden you have to pay them twice as much. And then you have to go to your salespeople and your partnerships people, you know, like the people at Walmart that own the relationship with Procter and Gamble or something, right? And they, and they understand how in-store shelf pricing works. Those people now, you take away their power and you say, now you make half as much money. 
So like, how do you, how do you disrupt your own organization? That way is actually quite challenging. Because if you look at how Amazon runs, that is how Amazon runs. Like the engineers make all the money. They yeah. have twice the power. The CEO is a, is a computer scientist by training. Like it's, it's just like organizationally, it looks very different. Um, and that, that pattern sort of recurs if you look at uh, a lot of other industries. You know, look at like Tesla and how they run versus traditional businesses. Look at um, social media versus traditional media businesses. Like, you know, like in, in most um in most traditional media businesses, like Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg might be like the CIO or the VP of product and Cheryl would be the right. CEO. And that's, that's not how Facebook is set up, right? So you kind of have to bend the organization. So our belief was venture is going to have to be the same. Like the engineers have to run the show. So we don't have any, we don't have any associates or principals. We just hire a bunch of engineers. Uh, you know, we think over time, a lot of the really interesting stuff is just going to be purely on chain. And so, you know, things like uh, you've seen lock, lock drops happen, or, you know, you have to liquidity mine to really earn the tokens. Um, you can't, you can't even go buy the tokens. You have to like do something on chain to earn the tokens. These kinds of things become the new way that, that venture capital firms have to operate. Um, and you're not, you know, it's, it's not like you go to the ferry building or the meatpacking district and, and go to drinks with somebody or go to a happy hour. And that's how you source an investment. No, you have to be sitting in discord, right? So like everything from, from like how you find investment opportunities to how you actually give them the money to then once you have made the investment, how do you actually help them? Well, it's, you're not sitting on a board and, and trying to figure out how to hire the next salesperson, you're in a DAO looking at proposals, or, you know, you're taking your tokens on chain and locking them up into a, you know, into a vote escrow and getting VE tokens that you're then going to stake somewhere else. Like all of the mechanics of actually how you run your business are totally different. Um, and so we've designed the organization to, to be able to do all of those things and lean into all of those things. Cause we think ultimately that's where the world goes. And that, so that's what I mean by future proof is like, we're, we're set up to do all of those things and we participate in on chain in all sorts of interesting ways. Um, which then, of course, you know, like there's there's a flywheel there because then founders, once they figure that out, they're like, well, would I rather have some trad VC or would I rather have Electric who can do all these things and help, you know, be the first couple of million dollars into my liquidity pool or, or you know, help um, help me get, you know, vote a signal to the market that they're willing to lock up for right. three or four years and all this kind of stuff, right? So, well, um, it's like it's music to my ears to think about the fact that so much of the stuff that we used to have to do and slog through, like sometimes, although I do enjoy human contact a lot, <laughs> I think that, um, going to drinks and having to sit in the financial yeah. district for all of these things is not like the the, the place to do it. It's fascinating yeah. if you think about your structure first. And not only did Walmart need to think about doing what you just said, it also needed to start by thinking about engineers in the first place, which mm -hmm. of course they did probably like, I, I think I remember like probably 10 years ago. Eight yeah. years ago, they started really doing Walmart online and yeah. it's still taken them this long to get there. Yeah. Well, there's right. so much to unpack because so much of what you've done, like what you just talked about is where you are now, but you've come from, uh, you know, doing so many different things. I mean, based on what I, my look at your background, you're, you're a serial entrepreneur and I'm yeah. always really interested to hear uh, how that begins for people, because I think it mm. often starts early in life is, you know, like you, my, my kids, they used to do like the lemonade stands down the street and they buy yeah. brownies and, you know, those kinds of things start early. So what was your first business idea or job and how did it, how did it get you to here? Yeah. So my first business adventure was when I was about, I think it was like nine or 10. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I got a, uh, I bought it. So I used to be really good at math. I'm no longer, uh, I used to be. And, uh, and so I was taking, um, uh, like my, my, most of my day was at the elementary school, but I would go to the high school for classes. And so I was, I was in some advanced math classes and, and, uh, my parents brought me, bought me a graphic calculator. And, uh, well, those we are were... all things that are required for those advanced <laughs> math people. My kids use those yeah. too. So yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I knew it was a, uh, like, it was, it was like 80 or hundred bucks, but you know, I, I grew up very modestly. So for my parents, that was a lot of money. Um, and so what I did was I read the manual, it was some version of basic, um, and, uh, the programming language and I learned to program the thing. And then what I would do is I would, I would read ahead, um, by like a week or two. And then I would write programs to solve like the subsequent weeks, uh, like problem sets. Um, oh, that's awesome. and, <laughs> and then, and then I would go into class and sell them for a dollar each, but there were, there were like two periods. And so I started making like 50 bucks a week. Um, cause I was just selling ahead for like the next week's homework. So you would um, sell the, 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 the code, you would be able to program the individual, the other, the other, um, yeah, I would just sell these programs. Yeah. So it'd be like, oh, here's like the quadratic equation solver program. And, uh, and then I would sell it to you know, everybody for a buck. And, um, and so I was running like my own little app store. So, but I you know, I was like nine years old. So I couldn't do anything with the money. I was mobile. I was just like ride the bus to the high school and then like go home. And so I just ended up, I, I started making like 50 bucks a week. And so after a couple of months I had like, you know, 
hundreds, you know, probably like a thousand dollars. And it was just, it was like all dollar bills that were stuck in, in like a desk drawer at home. And so one day my, my mom found this desk drawer full of like, you know, a thousand dollars. And she was like, what the hell, <laughs> like, what are you, are you like selling drugs? Like, are you in trouble? Like what's going on? <laughs> um, and so I talked to them and they were like, you're doing what? Uh, and so I, I gave them the money back. I was like, oh, here's like a hundred bucks for the calculator. I'm just going to keep the rest. Um, and they were like, what? This is ridiculous. And so, um, you know, I went, to, I went to Stanford and I studied computer science and, and um, ended up started, I started my first company in high school um, and eventually sold it and then started another one that we sold to Facebook. Um, but it was funny because you know, now I, I have, a, I have a, a young child now and it's, it's just, it's so, it's funny to me now because you do see like personalities coming out pretty young. So when I was graduating college, my, my folks were like, yeah, we pretty much figured out what you were going to do by the time you were like eight or nine. It's like very obvious what you're going to do. So I don't know where that came from. It's just sort of, you know, like hey, there's probably some combination of stumbling into graphing calculators and computers like pretty early and being fortunate and some curiosity and like, you know, being bored. And, you know, it was, it was the era before really mainstream internet uh, and we couldn't really afford you know, internet access back then anyway. So um, it's just too expensive at the time. Um, and so I think probably some combination of like boredom and necessity sort of like fueled, fueled some creativity. Isn't that funny to think about the, I mean, my kids were, I remember one time my son came home from school and I went through his backpack to get some lunch out and I found all these dollars also in his backpack. Yeah. It was nothing to do with a calculator. He was in fact winning prizes at school and then selling those prizes to his friends. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Which I thought was like a really, I was like, no, go give the money back to them um, yeah. because you won those prizes for, for nothing. But anyway, it's yeah. just a really interesting thing to see that early stage of your life yeah. and how that like already created such an impact on like who you were going to be. But did you have a sense then that you wanted to be able to build software and create and be creative in that way? Or was it just like that just sort of came to you? Uh, yeah, I think, I, I do think, yeah, I, I do think creating software is a really creative endeavor. Like I, I, I do think entrepreneurs and software engineers, it is a form of creative expression. Um, just like, you know, writing a fiction novel or painting a painting. It's just, it's just like another tool that humans have created. It happens to be a digital tool. Um, and it's, uh, honestly, it's one of the things I really miss about not really writing that much code anymore. It's just as a like creative outlet, it's really, it's pretty awesome to be able to manipulate something and have it do what you want it to do. Um, and I think that's just like a natural human thing. Like humans just want to, I think it's one of the things that sets us apart from, from all the other animals is this act of creation and self-expression. Um, yeah, just, it just so happened to be the case, I think through some, some semblance of luck that the, the sort of like the tools, the, the paintbrushes that I was given happened to be digital paintbrushes when I was a kid. And so, you know, that's just happened to be the canvas. Yeah, I love that. So now you're in this very cool position to put capital and support the visions and the creations of others. Yeah. And you've decided to focus on crypto and specifically like Web3 founders. So I'd love to know more about like, when was your crypto light bulb moment and what motivated you to focus there? Yeah. So Curtis and I, um, when we were doing that startup that, that eventually sold to Facebook, um, it was this kind of the core thing that we were doing with that company was uh, building a bunch of mobile infrastructure. So we were running a giant distributed system across multiple data centers uh, with a lot of GPUs. And, um, and we ran into some Bitcoin miners, this was like 2010. We ran into Bitcoin miners and, um, and because we were sitting on all this excess compute power, um, we started mining some Bitcoin and we're just kind of playing with it. Um, and we actually, funnily enough, we misunderstood what Bitcoin was. Like at, at the time we thought, we thought what Bitcoin was, was a way to pay for computational power on a distributed network. And, and we like Curtis and I had never, we're both engineers. So we, we never taken a finance or economics class. We, we like didn't understand this concept of commodities and fixed supply assets and stores of value. And this kind of stuff was just very foreign to us. We're all, we're, we're self-taught on all of these things. Um, and so we thought it was a way to pay for computational power. And when it wasn't working as the way, in, in sort of in the way that we thought it, that it should be, we eventually just kind of sold most of our Bitcoin. Um, and then we saw Ethereum in 2015. And, we, and, and that was a light bulb moment for us where I, I remember literally I was, I was on an exercise bike um, and my, uh, my wife was my girlfriend at the time. Um, and I was, watching, I was watching this video of Vitalik and he sort of explained it. And like, I, I remember that very exact moment, the light bulb went off and I, I just said, holy shit. And I stopped biking. And I think my, my girlfriend, my wife was like, oh my God, did you like, are you having a heart attack? Like what's going on? But it was kind of this like amazing moment where I was like, wait a second, like this makes a ton of sense. Um, this actually is a new way to build software and this thing might actually work. Um, and so in, in a lot of ways, like, it, you know, Ethereum was the thing that we thought 
Bitcoin was. We were just mistaken about what Bitcoin was. And so we kind of got our heads around Ethereum in like 1516. And we said, wow, this is crazy. And, which then forced a bunch of questions because we're like, well, okay, if this is the thing that Bitcoin, that we thought Bitcoin was, then what's Bitcoin? Because Bitcoin's still around, which, which sort of like led us down this road of understanding um, finance and money and stores of value and like a lot of other stuff, which then helped us understand Ethereum and crypto and DeFi and kind of like a, a lot of the spaces have come so that it was symbiotic. But for us, it was really actually from an engineer's perspective, understanding the, the potential for something as cool as Ethereum and what that could be if you did have this distributed world computer. Um, and kind of all the all the really cool stuff that would happen if that came to be true, and then kind of the other big signal that we looked at um, is, is really qualitative. It was like, um, you know, we were spending all of our time on this in in 2016 and 2017 before we started Electric. We were just hanging out in chat rooms and um, and dabbling and you know playing with tokens and writing code. And it was just it was a lot of fun. We were just playing around, and um, the energy in the community was, and I think still is. Yeah, it, it is like the natural successor to the internet. Like, you know, it just, yeah. it reminds me of being really young kid, being in these chat rooms and there's a handle and somebody on the other side of the chat is just really smart and they're saying stuff and you don't know if they're 16 or 26 or 66. You just know that they're really smart. Matter. Yeah. And it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's a yeah. global community and it's a really, it's like a bizarro community. You know, it's scientists and technologists and computer scientists, but it's also college kids and it's college professors. It's also, you know, the CIA and the FBI are in the mix and there's, you know, billionaires in the mix and there's, um, you know, adult film stars and drug dealers and, you know, international mm -hmm. criminals in the mix. And it's just, you know, it's such a, such a motley crew of people. And so I, I look at that group of people and I kind of think every 10 to 20 years, all of those people show up in one place. And, and if they do, that was, that was like PCs, that was the internet, that was early mobile, that was, you know, that's crypto. And every time that happens, you should really pay attention, like as an investor or as a founder. Yeah. And so that combination of things where we're like, wow, this is really interesting tech and a really different way to think about software, plus all of the same people that made the internet happen when we were kids, all of those people are back. Um, and that that sniffed to us like really, really, really big opportunity. And so we, we kind of jumped into it basically full time at the end of 2016. Yeah, I mean, I think it's so true. Just coming through from the early days of the internet and then obviously the early days of the web and thinking about the parallels. I just put a piece out actually on um, on the dot-com bubble and how everybody's comparing it to what's happening in crypto today. And in fact, there's some similarities, but there's a lot of differences about what, what that was. But like really thinking about that time and all those, all the innovation and creativity and some of it was that there wasn't, you know, people didn't know like what revenue models and how to make this thing work. And certainly cookies, nobody had mm. any sense of what cookies would yeah. actually turn into. <laughs> yeah. And like the, the value of all of this, of all this personal data that was eventually leveraged by the web um, and by web companies. But I, I do find like, I remember early days way, way, way back when, and I was working as a lawyer outside and I was sitting at Yahoo's offices. They were a client of mine and had been for a really long time. So really early web days. And everybody there was young and focused on like what the things were that could be developed and created. And it was just so fun. And I find that same creativity and energy here too, even still today. I mean, I know yeah. that's 2016, but I still see it today just because there's so much that's happening. I do have a question with, you said that you're self-taught with respect to like the finance side and yeah. all, uh, all of that. Like, how did you guys do that? How did you teach yourselves? <laughs> YouTube uh, is the short answer. Um, I, I think YouTube, my first startup was an education company. And I think YouTube is probably the world's biggest and most successful education company. Uh, I, I've probably learned as much off of YouTube as I did in college. It's just unbelievable. Um, so yeah, so I just ended up watching hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of, of videos, like um, of, of people talking about this stuff and, and trying to understand it. And then from there, you know, being able to springboard to being able to read papers and, and you know, once you understand enough, the internet is, is such a magical and wonderful place. You can just cold DM people and, some person who's you know world famous and thinks about these things really deeply will just respond to you, um, and so yeah, it's, it's basically the internet. But starting with YouTube, just getting up to speed by just watching a ton of videos on this stuff. That's so awesome! It's so awesome for people to know that that's actually something that they can do. They don't need yeah. their MBA to be able to figure this stuff out. Yeah, not at all. Uh, what is the what is it about Web three specifically? Um, you've talked a lot about the things that you focus on and the why and the the reasons why. But what specific area of Web three do you see that's so promising? Yeah, so I think there are a lot of areas about Web3 that are extremely promising. The, the big, like at a 100,000 foot view, super, super high level, it took me a long time to understand this and articulate it, but 
I, I realized that the thing that gets me really, really excited about the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, like how can, you know, the thing I was looking for for so long when I was doing the startups was just, what is the thing that I can really believe in for decades and decades? And I, I will not get tired of believing in that thing. And for me, what, what I realized was ultimately that that thing is finding and helping really, truly brilliant people realize their full potential. Like I think in some alternate universe, maybe I would have been like a math teacher or something. Um, and it just turns out that like the internet has enabled all this really amazing economic opportunity. And I think I'm actually pretty good at this. If you if, like, you know, I look at my, my seed investing track record prior to starting electric. Um, and obviously our, our early track record here, I think is strong, which is why we've been able to raise so much capital. Um, but, you know, I think about at a, at a hundred thousand foot view, I think that the single most underutilized resource in the world is human brain power. Like, I think we've only really tapped a couple million brains and, and really we should be tapping. I mean, even if you only consider the top 10%, let's say just in terms of brain power, that's like 700 million people. That's a lot of people. And what that says to me is we should probably have 500 Elons. You know, we should have 500 Einsteins. We should have, you know, 500 Jonas Salts, like the, you know, the 500 Marie Curie is like, just like the amount of brain power that's sitting in the world untapped would just unleash so much innovation and, and prosperity and productivity and um, improvements in, in you know basic human um, standards of living. And the, the problem- So when you say is, we should have, it, it means we actually do have them somewhere out there and you're saying we just don't correct. know where they all are. Yeah. Exactly, right. And so then you say, okay, well, if you, if you believe that premise that there's probably a hundred X potential out there in, in human uh, potential, like A, how do you find those people? That's like a huge, huge part of it. Um, B, you know, what do they need to be successful? And, and what I've come to believe just being able, being so fortunate, you know, I think one, A is solved. Like the internet lets us find these people now. Like everybody's online, like three out of those 7 billion, four out of those 7 billion people, about half the world is now online. Um, you know, and so what do, you, what do they really need? In my opinion, a lot of what these people really need is just a little bit of capital and a lot of emotional support. And, and I think the case study for this is something like Y Combinator or, or frankly, internet mm -hmm. investing over the last 15 to 20 years. Like yeah. you can get Airbnb or Stripe or, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be involved with companies like, you know, Notion or Figma or Deal or, you know, these, these $10 billion plus kinds of crews, you know, $10 billion plus kinds of outcomes. And the dollar amount that went in to get the flywheel going was tiny. It's like $200,000, $250,000. Um, and it was, it was a really, really talented, motivated, small group of people with a couple hundred thousand dollars. But then the critical thing was they got support along the way. They got mentorship, they got advice, and they had, they had a core group of people that really, really believed in them. Um, and so if you sort of put all that together, the thing I've come to believe is that we, we probably should have something like 500 million to a billion like technology entrepreneurs, uh, like people who can truly do step function changes in society. And they don't need that much money. They need on the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the flywheel going. And then they need people who really believe in them. And I, I've seen the power of that. You know, it's just when somebody believes in you even more than you believe in yourself, um, because they think that you're capable of greatness in a way that maybe even you don't realize, that just unlocks that level of, of capacity and potential from, from a lot of people. And so to me, what's really exciting about crypto is the internet kind of solved step one, which is like, how do we find all these people? Because it, it connected us all. And actually I think crypto might solve step two, which is how do we get money to these people? Um, mm -hmm. Because now you don't have to be in Silicon Valley or New York to start a company. Um, you know, you don't have to like be co-located and go, you know, pitch on Sand Hill Road. You can, you can get on a Zoom call, or you can be in a Discord, or you can write some code and you can push it out there into these crypto systems. And if you're really, really smart, like we don't know who Satoshi is. Like Vitalik was in Vancouver. Um, you know, you look at you look at some of like the most interesting, innovative things that are happening in crypto, and it's some random person. You don't even know who they are. You don't know how old they are. You don't know, you don't know what country they're in. Um, and 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 the money can flow to them, right? And and all of a sudden, the resources can come to them. Um, and so that that's ultimately what we're trying to build with Electric is like, how do you build a machine that can identify these people, that can get the money to them, and then give them the support that they need to basically believe in themselves. And if you find all the right people, it actually turns out that's super easy. Like you, these, some of the, yeah. I mean, I, I like the founders that we have and they're just brilliant. And I'm just like, I, like for all the people you give money to, you know, it's just, when I talk to them, I'm like, I don't even, you don't even understand how good you are. Like, you don't, you, you have not 
you're like 25 and like you have not yet internalized how good you are. And when you realize how good you are, you get that little bit of a flywheel going, a little bit of success. Like you, you're just going to be such a monster entrepreneur, you know. And but it's it's like it's almost it almost blows my mind how simple it sounds, you know. But I, I do think like all the biggest things in society, they're they're simple. They're not easy, but they're actually like pretty yeah. simple. And I think it's pretty simple. It's like let's find 500 million to a billion entrepreneurs. Let's give them a couple hundred thousand dollars, which we can now do because of crypto, and they can be anywhere in the world. And let's believe in them. And if you do, like amazing shit will happen. You know, we'll get to Mars. We'll like, you know, put bases on the moon. We'll like, you know, traverse the oceans. We'll solve fusion. Like we'll do all of that stuff. And to me, crypto is just like the path to making that happen. And so step one is, can you build that machinery? And what I would love is 20, 30, 40 years from now, we're, we're you know, electric is much, much more than crypto. And, but what we've done is built like the machinery to identify these people and get the flywheel going and, and just unlock all of that potential. That is, um, I think that one of the things that I love that comes out from what you're talking about is the the human part too. So a lot of times we forget the human part, particularly when we're doing investments and particularly when a lot of it just becomes about the money, but it is yeah. really about encouraging those developers, those creators, those innovators. That One of the things I love about uh, crypto blockchain and just the focal points that it's really truly global because- yeah. I love to be able to focus on local founders and those local founders are solving problems in ways that we never, as I, where I sit in California, might not be able to see that there's a need. And so this is why I think it's so important to do what you're doing and to think about founders as not just these potential dollar signs for return on investment, but to think about growing them and helping them because then, they, then they'll give back and they'll grow the other folks that are around them. And that's the thing that I think is so awesome. My favorite part of my, my role now is working with these companies that we invest in to help them to be able to become whatever it is they want to be. And then hopefully they can help others to do the same. So I love that piece of it. In terms of your investments and where you guys look, do you, do you have specific geographies that you focus on or really is it truly global? Yeah, truly global. Um, yeah, we, we invest in North America. We invest in Europe, um, Israel, Asia, kind of all over. You know, I think the, the only constraint for us is, are you tackling a large enough market and do we understand that market? Um, and so the second one often ends up being a constraint for us. So for example, like it's really tough for us to, we, we get inbounded by Nigerian entrepreneurs all the time uh, or Brazilian entrepreneurs. And these are really big, big markets. It's just, we're not deep enough on those markets. And so if those founders are targeting those markets, it's really tough for us to be involved. It's never say never, but um, whereas if you, let's say are Nigerian or Brazilian or Israeli or, uh, German or, you know, whatever founder, and you're targeting a global market, uh, or you're targeting, you know, DeFi, which is sort of, you know, cross jurisdictional and global, or you're targeting developer tools, which are global. Like there, there are markets that you can be in one place and target the rest of the world. Um, if you're doing that, it's a little bit easier for us because we have, some, we have some expertise there. Cause the other thing we think about too, is, you know, um, ultimately are, are we the right people to, to partner with you and be helpful to you? And, if it's too far outside our zone of, of expertise, then we're just not the right people to work with you and help you. And I, I, a lot of these things I've learned too, the hard way, um, I'm sure you've seen this too, is like the way one market behaves is not the way another behaves. And so if you try to pattern match, if you think you know what's going on in a market where you just have no context, you may actually give people terrible advice. You know, like that, that mar yeah. mar market may work the opposite of the way that you expect. Um, and so we're very wary of trying to go into, into markets and sectors that we're not pretty deep on because we, we would never want to, uh, you know, out of good intention, we would never want to give somebody bad advice. Yeah, we. I think that that's, that's a really significant challenge. One of the things we have is a matching fund. And so the matching fund really tries to focus with founders who already have back, uh, you know, they're backed by a VC like yours or some other reputable VC that we can just give them the 500 up to 500,000. But when you do that, we don't have that same kind of connection with them. And so it makes it, it's great for them. But then I sometimes do worry that the matching funds, funds like that aren't really focusing on, is this the right space for us to be contributing this kind of equity to, is it really going to help them to move forward without our yeah. attention to, to, to yeah. what they're doing? So I think that's yeah. a perfect way to think about it. Um, in terms of the, um, one of the key areas that I know that you focused on is DAOs. And uh, we had a conversation before we jumped on where you gave this great story about a potential like DAOs that you can see and where you see the future going when we were at an event together and I loved it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, for our listeners who aren't familiar with it, can you just explain what a DAO is and why you're uh, sure. focused or interested in them? Yeah, uh, I think of DAOs as essentially internet native corporations. Um, there's, uh, you know, if you, if you look at the history of 
of corporations or, or limited liability corporations. I think it's it's a pretty it sounds super dry, but I think it's really interesting, which is, you know, at some point somebody said, oh, we should have a corporation like somebody. That's just a concept that somebody invented and roughly was invented you know, in like the early 1600s and with the joint stock corporation uh, with, you know, like the Dutch East India Company. And it's a really big breakthrough because prior to that, when you when you were pursuing an endeavor, you could put your capital in and it was your personal capital um, and and you were at risk, right? If, if you if you built some widget and then that widget caught on fire and burned somebody's house down, they could come after you. And so we didn't have this separation of risk. We didn't have an entity that contained the risk that allowed people to then take risk. And we didn't have a way to finance it. So you had to put your own money in and you, and you had to take all the risk. And so a corporation is, is an amazing technology, actually. It's a, it's a piece of technology that somebody invented that said, oh, actually, here's a place you can put money in and some people can take risk with their capital and you can take risk with your labor and share in the upside and, and will contain the risk. So if the thing blows up and it does something bad, your personal assets are not online. The only assets that are, that are on the line are the ones that you put into the corporation. So we started that with- the Legal innovation humans. at its best. Legal it's innovation. Amazing. 100%. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really true. Like the, the people that invented this, it's, it's genius that, that you did that because that's what actually allowed you to pool capital. It's a new way to organize humans and coordinate humans. Um, and then for about 200 years, you needed to go to the king to get a charter to start a corporation. Uh, so from you know, like 1650 to 1850, roughly, you needed uh, the king's approval, uh, the king or queen's approval. And uh, obviously, that's a lot of friction. So, you know, in the U.S. and the U.K. in the mid 1800s, um, some people said, well, why do we have to go to the king? Well, we, you know, in the U.S., we don't have a king. Can you, you know, why do you even have to go to the governor to get one of these charters? Shouldn't you just be able to sign some paperwork and it's a standard thing and, and then you can just have a corporation? And, and that's what we do today, right? You can go to Delaware and start a C-Corp or an LLC, fill out some paperwork and you submit it online and a day later you, you have a corporation um, and it's all standardized. And, and so if somebody invented that, that concept was created like in the you know, 1850-ish. Um, and that actually was a huge breakthrough too because that's what allowed things like the railroads because now you could have capital formation and you could have people coordinating these very capital intensive things. Um, and so in a lot of ways, I think you know, the, the um, creation of, of corporations and, and sort of this legal innovation and technology um, was a huge enabler of the industrial revolution and of, of railroads and, and sort of all of that modernization that happened from you know the early 1800s through through the the middle of the 20th you know, mid late 20th century um, and so when you play that forward I, I think DAOs are just the natural evolution of that right it's just like instead of me having to fill out paperwork and go submit it to the government and wait three days and then I get the paperwork back and then I go to the bank and I say okay I have a mailbox and, and a government ID now and can I open a bank account? And they're like, well, what kind of industry are you in? And what's your personal credit score? And well, maybe we'll give you a bank account. And that takes seven days uh, in the best case. Um, and now you're like two weeks in and then you go raise some capital, with, you know, you do the thing and that might take you a couple of months. We take all of that and we reduce it to a button. And so in the same way that we, we made it a hundred X faster and cheaper and easier and reduce the friction, like going from Kings to just, hey, fill out the paperwork and send it to the state of Delaware. I think we basically have just done the same thing with Dallas. Like it's a hundred X easier, <clears throat> mm -hmm. or arguably a thousand X easier to just, you know, write a smart contract or push a button and you have a DAO on chain. Because what is that? That's now like you've created the entity, you've already got the bank account, the wallet address is the bank account and anybody, can, anybody in the world can now start giving you money. So I think we've just made it a hundred to a thousand X easier to create a corporation such that like every website, every human, every group of friends and every chat group can just have a wallet attached to it and that can essentially be a DAO. And now you can pool resources and coordinate um, that capital between these small groups of people. And every time you see that happen, generally speaking, if you look at, let's say, WhatsApp versus SMS, you, you know, when you reduce the friction to something by 10 to 100x, you see an explosion in usage of that thing by like 10,000 to a million x. So yeah. I, I, I tend to be on the end of the spectrum that I think there are going to be millions and millions and millions of DAOs in time. Um, because it's just an internet native corporation. It's just a new way that's internet native, that's entirely software enabled to have a company, have a pool of capital and have a bunch of humans coordinate around that. And now the time to create that thing is like 30 seconds instead of 30 days. Um, so abstractly I like speaking, to think about it in the, in the same way that we think about blockchain generally, which is removing intermediaries. Yeah. And so much of what blockchain does in, and just even in a payment process is to remove a bunch of intermediaries that not only cost money, but time. And so the way that you've just described the DAO and that friction, that friction is usually a bunch of intermediaries that come in. And sometimes you got to pay all those people that you mentioned, the state, the different bank accounts, those people all take a little bit of the money out. And 
and they take a little fee here and there. And so when you have all of this in a DAO, you've removed not just friction, you've removed intermediaries and removed cost. And that I think is what's beautiful about the opportunity there. 100%. And you know, it's still, it's still really early days. And so I think we'll see kind of what happens, but some of the early experiments here have been really fascinating, like Constitution DAO, like the ability, you know, they yeah. say, hey, we're gonna go do this thing and $50 million showed up in 48 hours, it's amazing. Um, or you know some of the some of the forward facing stuff that I think people are now starting to play with. Like we were talking about, could musicians create DAOs and crowdsource funding to go buy their their the rights uh, from the music labels and then have the record ha have the the recording uh, royalties flow across that back to the DAO holders. And so now you can have community owned music and and musicians don't need to sell all their rights to these centralized corporations and the fans can actually own the music. Um, so I, you know, that is my favorite example, by the way, I think about yeah. that all the time because I think about how true fans are so supportive and they would put 10 bucks in, they would oh, pay yeah. that much to be able to download the music anyway. And exactly. so they can put it in and then they can get a small return on it, but that's really not probably why they're doing it in the first place. Yeah. It is my favorite example of a DAO. And I want someone to go out and to do that <laughs> yeah. happen so that we can say, Avichal figured that out. And that's what somebody should actually go out and do. Yeah, no, I've, I've been talking about it for years and years, um, and it'll happen eventually. I mean, folks like Royal and um, you know Just, Justin over there and JD are playing with this kind of stuff, and um, you know um, Alex at the Chainsmokers is playing with this stuff, and, and so it's still really early days. Um, uh, it is it is very much kind of like you know blogs in the '90s before there were really blogs or social media in the '90s before social media. It's yeah. like somebody's going to crack this and turn it into a monster platform, and you can kind of see it, or or you know spot you know like V1. Spotify or you know even prior to Apple Music and iTunes happening like it's, it's we're kind of in that zone like somebody's definitely going to crack it and when they do it's you know there's going to be billions and billions of dollars that flows across and I think it's going to be great it's going to be awesome I, I love the idea that if I find some musician who's extremely talented before everybody else does that I can support them I can help them make their music and and maybe they and I get to get to benefit economically in the long term um, so I, I yeah I hope all that stuff happens. Me too. Talk about intermediaries that could be removed totally. um, from, from that, from an artist standpoint. I have two more questions. We only have a few more minutes left. One of them is, I think sure. it would be so awesome to hear from you. Um, any mistakes or missed opportunities that stand out to you in your recent <laughs> experience? Like, what did you learn from it? What was it? And what did you learn from it? Yeah, I'm laughing because it's all mistakes. I kind of like <laughs> the thing I say is like, as, as a VC, you, you, have, you have to sort of resign yourself to be miserable because there's only two types of investments. There are the investments that you passed on that ended up being huge. And there are the investments that you did where even if they ended up being huge, you really probably should have put in more money. So it's just sort of like, <laughs> it's like no matter what you do, you probably screwed up. Um, uh, so yeah, there's countless. You know, I think um, we've underestimated, like we originally underestimated how powerful and big NFTs would be. I think there were a few people that were essentially folks like Rohom over at Dapper um, or, you know, the OpenSea, you know, Devin and Alex at OpenSea, people, a handful of people that basically saw the potential for NFTs and said, the, these things could be bigger than cryptocurrencies. And that's kind of the, the worldview I've come to that actually uh, crypto is going to go mainstream through NFTs. And so that's why we um, were big investors in Magic Eden, for example. Um, so I think not spotting NFTs early enough was a huge mistake. Um, I think underestimating um, the, the power of some of the centralized entities like the FTXs and Binances of the world to help bootstrap decentralized ecosystems. And so, you know, I think um, Sam at, at FTX and CZ at Binance really deserve a lot of credit for bootstrapping some of the decentralized ecosystems and getting those things off the ground. You know, like I don't think Solana exists without SBF. Um, yeah. uh, and so I think we really underestimated the power of some of these centralized entities to help bootstrap decentralized ecosystems. Um, you know, I think uh, we, I think uh, we've, uh, historically, we, we have um, been like really bullish on on uh, stable coins recently, but I think we also underestimated the the power and potential of those. Um, we wrote a paper back in um, 2020 about how the U.S. government needs to embrace stable coins, and I think they're actually generally moving in that direction now. Um, but I think for you know from 2010 to 2020 with with Tether, for example, I think most people really underestimated the the role that um, USD stable coins might play in this ecosystem. I think it's one of the great ironies of of crypto that may be one of the killer applications is actually the crypto dollar um yeah. and uh but yeah i could you know if i if i went through our portfolio all of the things that we passed on that have gone on to be huge and and so many of the things that then our portfolio have gone on to be well that i look back and i'm like man why didn't we put in 
double or triple or quadruple the money that you could have. Um, so those yeah, are good. Those are both good problems to have, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. This has been so awesome. I'm so grateful for you taking the time to, to there are so many more things that I could, I could go through with you. I do have one last question. Where could sure. people go to keep up with you and your work? Oh, easy. Uh, Twitter is the best. So at Avichal on Twitter, A-V-I-C-H-A-L or at Electric Capital on Twitter. Um, we, um, we have, we have uh, about 20 people on the team now. Um, as, I, as I said, mostly engineers and, and designers and product people. Um, and so um, if you follow along the Electric Capital Twitter account, we'll retweet a bunch of it and you can see like our, our mirror uh, posts and medium posts. And there's, there's a bunch of good content that we throw out there that sort of shares a bunch of these thoughts. Well, I certainly enjoyed this conversation and uh, I, I do, and I keep up with you on, on, on Twitter. And I think it's really interesting what you guys are doing. You just raised your billion dollar fund. There's so much more that you guys have going on there. Um, I love that you spent the time with us. Thank you so much for joining Block by Block and uh, keep up the great work. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to Block by Block. Don't forget to subscribe to get notified when new episodes are released and follow me on Twitter to stay in the loop in between episodes. I'll talk to you next time.